Welcome to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're dialing in from. By way, of, by way of introduction, I will I will mute everybody who's not on mute. Excuse me for that. It's just so we don't have any background noise. By way of introduction, my name is Deborah Keller, and I lead on the Impact for Breakfast initiative, supported by Arthur Impact, the impact investing arm of the Rianta Capital Family Office. This specialized group has been gathering and growing since 2008, starting in London with an expansion today to 29 cities and chapters around the globe. Our informal network counts 3,200 members who are meeting virtually and at in-person gatherings in the local chapters to discuss challenges, models, methodologies, case studies, and ideas that help us each better navigate and understand the space between financial and social return. Our objective with our informal gatherings is to help build relationships and the learning that drives action and ultimately capital into this sector. Our events and sessions are led by sector experts and are a safe space for brainstorming and deconstructing the most challenging questions we face in the impact space. Impact for Breakfast is an informal network of family offices, foundations, funds, venture philanthropy, and intermediary organizations with a common focus on social enterprise, entrepreneurship, and impact investing. For those who are here for the very first time and wish to learn more about the Impact for Breakfast network, you're welcome to visit our website, impactforbreakfast.com. I will make sure to share the link in, our, in the chat field shortly. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome you to the part three on Mission Multiplier, how Swiss NGOs, foundations, and philanthropists can leverage impact investing. No worries if you have not attended part two, uh, one and two. Today's session is not a continuation of the first two sessions. However, I'll make sure to send along both recordings so you can have a look, a look at the, the topics we've discussed previously. Now I have the pleasure to give you a quick introduction um, of our wonderful speakers we have with us today. I have with me Stephanie Jones, um, Good Energies Foundation. She is a glo global program manager. Audrey Pesso from Jacobs Foundation, Impact Investing Professional, Investment Professional. And of course, also Frederick um, Bernay, Head of Products and Risk at iGravity who's um, the co-host for this series, along with Tim, who cannot join us today. I want to inform you that this session is being recorded. As I mentioned early, earlier, I will be sending those recordings along so you can pass them to your colleagues or your networks that should see the session or the topics we've discussed today. After the presentation, we'll move over a Q&A and discussion round. Again, I want to inform you that this is an informal group, so please feel free to unmute yourself, share your thoughts, questions, comments, and ideas. We would love to hear them. And if you can think of a question for our speakers during the presentation, you can also use the chat field um, on your screen to post them there and we'll do our best to cover them all. That's all from me. And now with no further ado, over, you, over to you, Frederick. Thank you very much, Deborah. Good morning, everyone. Sorry to be on a, on a black screen today. It's a little bit uh, awkward, but I'm, I'm very pleased to, to, to start this uh, third session that we did. And, and before we start, I wanted to also uh, excuse uh, Tim Raji, who has been the, the initiator and uh, our co-host for the first two, two missions. He's traveling abroad and it was a little bit uh, difficult for him to join, potentially more difficult than me. <laughs> so... Um, um, today we'll we'll try to to go into two new aspects with uh, Stephanie Joan and Audrey Pesso of of um, mobilizing philanthropic capital for impact investment. Maybe a, a, a quick few words about iGravity for those who don't know us. Um, in in very short, we're specializing in impact investing only, towards the whole range of it, and and we're doing consultancy works as well as investments. So consultancies mainly with foundation and government institution to, to mobilize the, the philanthropic capital into impact investing. So we're very close to blended finance solution. 
And on the investment side, we have a team in Africa. We're doing direct investment there, um, specifically also for foundation mandate. One of them being the Jacobs Foundation. We have a team in Nairobi and Kampala of uh, seven people today. And we are also making uh, diversified products of investment solution for um, wealth manager and, and private banks in, in impact first solution. And that's a team we have uh, here in Zurich and Milano. So I, I, I will stop there because I could talk for, for a long time, but I think the, the idea today was um, also to introduce you with Morgan Loisel, which is um, here with us at iGravity. Who... I think we lost uh, Fred. But I guess I, I can continue otherwise. So hi, everybody. So my name is Morgan. As Fred was trying to explain, I'm working on the consulting arm of iGravity. So in my role, I'm advising development actors on impact investing. So basically, it means that I'm trying to inspire them and convince more of these development actors to try out new and more effective way of, of, um, yeah, of achieving their missions. So today, um, as you have seen, it's our third webinar on impact investing for NGOs and foundations. Um, we have seen four examples of actors active in this space in the past webinar. Today, we will see two additional examples. And that's why we wanted to help you digest this information. So we know it's a lot of, um, of complex terms that we are using. There are a lot of definitions. So what we have tried today is really to classify and organize the different approaches existing out there. So I will share a framework that we have developed here. So what we have tried to do is to organize these approaches along two key dimensions. So you can see on the horizontal axis, we see the expected financial returns of the approaches. On the vertical axis, you have the approach to impact. And as you can see, um, we have the spectrum of approaches for non-profit actors, which is circled in red, so at the top of the screen. And in terms of impact, we can see that non-profit actors are on the highest scale of impact. So their approach are either intentional, meaning that they actively attempt to solve a social or environmental problem. And we see furthermore actors going in the evidence-based approach space. So meaning that they don't are only intentional about impact, but they want to invest or allocate the funding based on evidence meaning that they will look for impact studies, et cetera, before allocating the, the funding. When you look at the, at the horizontal axis, so the financial returns, here you see that the spectrum is much broader. So with approaches ranking from complete loss of capital to market rates, financial returns. And if we start on the left-hand side with the complete loss of capital, so it's really where most of the non-profit actors still are. So most of them are focusing on grant-making um, approaches. Then moving more on the right inside, when we move to the partial capital recovery, it's where we see approaches like innovative finance and venture philanthropy. So those two approaches are not exactly the same, but they have some similarities, so that's why I group them. Um, so here, what the nonprofit actors are trying to do is that they work mainly with social enterprises, and compared to uh, traditional grant approaches here, they try to adapt their instruments, so be it, be it financial or non-financial instrument to the needs of these um, entrepreneurs. It can range from complete loss of capital to partial capital recovery until below market rates. And then when you move further on the right, you have what we call impact investings. So those are all the investments which are uh, which have the intention to achieve a positive social and environmental impact alongside with a financial return. And this financial return is key because here in impact investing, you will see that there are two different um, financial returns expectations. So either it's below market 
with uh, investors which are ready to compromise on their profit for an increased impact. And then you have the market rates of finance first impact investing where they want um, to really achieve this, this financial return uh, market. So um, as I was saying, that is illustrative. It's a framework. It's just to make sure that we have the same or a common understanding um, and, and can speak the same language, hopefully, in this webinar. So now with this next slide, I would like to summarize a bit um, what were the different approaches that we have seen in the past. So starting on, on the left-hand side, uh, the first speaker we had in the first webinar was WWF. So they are an international NGO which launched the Madagascar Biodiversity Fund. So its structure at the foundation and what they did is that they used debt swap to build the capital of the foundation. And then um, the capital of the foundation was invested in both traditional and social responsible investment. But what they did special is that part of the investment policy was specifying that they could invest up to 20% in impact investing. And then with this endowment fund, they were um, getting revenue or proceeds that they were then allocated as grant money to conservation uh, projects. So I think it was a really interesting and innovative approach. Then we had the second speaker was Oxfam. So Oxfam is also uh, another international NGO. Um, they've decided to work increasingly with social entrepreneurs to end injustice and poverty. So they use what we call venture philanthropy. Um, so they deployed various financial and non-financial tools. They also um, employed gender um, or deployed a gender lens approach and know that they, they have realized that in their venture philanthropy approach, they managed to um, conserve their capital and even make some revenue. They are willing to move more and more to the impact investing space to scale their program. The third speaker we had was ex -Eper. So ex -Eper is a Swiss nonprofit organization and they um, allocated part of their endowment to impact investing. Um, they are doing debt financing to SME. They also provide technical assistance and their goal is to improve livelihood in rural communities. So they target mainly growth stage impact enterprises and their goal is um, capital preservation. And the last example to conclude was Alpha Mundi Foundation. So Alpha Mundi Foundation is the nonprofit arm of Alpha Mundi Group. Um, Alpha Mundi, as you know, is an impact investment manager. And what the foundation is doing is that they provide pre and post um, investment technical assistance. They also provide guarantee and their goal is really to improve the investability of impact enterprises. So with this approach, they are um, solving the, the problem of accessing a quality pipeline for Alpha Mundi Group, but also for other impact investors. So as you can see, really for, uh, there are some similarities, of course, between those approaches, but really always approaches which are adapted to the organization launching it. Um, so yeah, there are, there are a lot and we will see two more two days. And to finalize before giving the word to, to Stephanie, I wanted to make the exercise to then map this, um, this organization or the initiative that we discussed from this organization on the purpose framework. So you will see, again, it's my interpretation. Uh, we can discuss that, of course. But you can see that um, VVF and Alpha Mundi Foundation would be more here on the at the between the traditional grant making and the innovative venture philanthropy space. Oxfam is clearly in the venture philanthropy um, space and trying to move more to the right. You have XEP, which is an impact investing. Uh, trying impact investing with this impact first approach. And then when we look at VVF, so as I as explained, they were doing investment on one side, getting proceeds for that and spending them on conservation projects. So that's why VVF is on different parts depending on the, the way you look at their program. 
So that would be it for my side. I hope it helped a bit frame the discussion. And with that, I don't know if Ted is back. If he is not back, I think I will just give the word to Stephanie. Okay, can you hear me, Morgan? Ah, yeah, you are back. Yes, we can yeah, hear. Yeah, so, sorry, sorry for that. No, I, I, I don't have much to add, Morgan. This is a uh, very good, okay. and I think um, I, I would like to give the word to Stephanie to deep in right away into the work of uh, good energies. So. Great, thank you so much, Fred and Morgan and, and Deborah. And thank you to I of Gravity and Alpha Mundi for organizing. Uh, good morning to everyone on the call. <clears throat> I'm happy to spend a few minutes uh, sharing some of our experiences at Good Energies Foundation. Um, you can go to the next slide uh, and then also be available for questions afterwards. So Good Energies Foundation is about 15 years old, um, registered here in Switzerland, where I'm also based. Um, we're part of Porticus, which is the global organization managing the family philanthropy of the Brennickmeyer family, a uh, Dutch and German family. Um, now in the seventh generation of running uh, a family business. And um, we at Good Energies focus on two main areas, clean energy access for development, um, providing electricity for communities that don't have affordable or reliable electricity access. And through that program, that's the one I lead, we, um, we focus on the solutions for end users and uh, and the enterprises that serve those communities. And then uh, the other main program we have is called Living Forest, which is about tropical forest protection and restoration. And that operates in the tropical green belt of the world, uh, the Congo Basin, uh, Amazon Basin, and Indonesia and Papua. And our energy program is currently in India and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, our ways of working really stem from the entrepreneurial nature of our trustees, so market-based approaches and embracing risk, both of which are very much needed in these two areas, clean energy and living forests, some other parts of their philanthropy that focus on education or um, sort of society might not take as much of a market-based approach, but um, where we operate, they do. And then um, key lessons that we've learned in our 15 years of philanthropy, the importance of the communities that we're trying to serve participating in the strategy development that we have and the importance of collaboration. So not only how we collaborate as a foundation with other funders, whether philanthropies or government funders or or commercial investors, but also encouraging our grantees and investees to collaborate with each other. And we take what we call a venture philanthropy oh. approach. Um, so I can get into that um, in the next slide. So this is very similar to the slide that Morgan presented. Um, this comes from the European Venture Philanthropy Association, this continuum of capital from impact focused on the left to finance focused and return and financial return focused on the right. And Good Energies Foundation focuses um, sort of from the middle over to the left. So we do plenty of impact only traditional grant making, um, but what I'm here to talk about today and what we're what we're doing more of um, is that impact first social investment. So um, you can see the very bottom line, sort of all of that is venture philanthropy, um, which has a number of tenants. Um, but where we focus is on this impact first. So I'm I'm an impact professional. Um, I have other colleagues internally who focus on some of the the financial aspects helping me understand the financial uh, models of companies, the likely returns, the best instrument um, to help that, you know, to help enterprises meet their needs, as well as our legal colleagues who just make sure that everything is legally sound. So to the next slide, please. So um, one of the things that EVPA talks about is the difference between impact uh, investing for impact versus investing with impact. I think folks on the call here know that there's actually quite a range of impact investors um, from those that, yeah, really focus on the impact 
first, as well as those that are investing for financial returns, but they are working in, in impact generating uh, areas of the market. Um, but these 10 elements of investing for impact, I thought were useful um, and, and actually help me in my discussions with my trustees, as well as other colleagues internally to think about, you know, which of these elements maybe are we focused on with particular deals? They don't all necessarily get equal um, attention and everything. For example, um, number six, providing extensive non-financial support. We're a super small team. I'm one and a half people that manage our energy programs. Um, so we don't have time to give a whole lot of non-financial support. Um, but we do try to make sure that our financial support um, includes funding so that companies can meet their needs um, and we're not just giving the minimum amount. Um, but some of some of these others, you know, measuring and managing social impact, that's the kind of thing that traditional philanthropy can do. Um, but it's very important in the impact investing field um, to really be able to understand the impact that your investments are having. So then in the next slide, please. Um, just a quick introduction to some of the, the specific deals that I have managed um, and what I continue to manage because some of these are ongoing. Um, so a number of different kinds of partners, um, including for-profit and nonprofit organizations. So as a Swiss registered foundation, we're allowed to give grants, of course, but also we're allowed to provide funding, either grants or investment to for-profit entities, as long as we can show that there's a social benefit um, to that funding. So I'm gonna talk in a little bit more detail about um, three of these, Selco India, the second one, Coco Networks, um, and then the last one, Charm Impact. Um, but you can see we've used a number of different financial tools from equity investments to loans to convertible grants um, or straight up investments. So this is the containers for you. And sorry, if everybody can make sure you're muting until we get to the question and answer session, that would be great. Um, I spent a lot of time um, sort of a few years ago turning the grants um, that we were able to give, which was um, the most common tool that I was allowed to, to give because that was our mandate into what the market needed. So in trying to support enterprises, they didn't always want grant funding because that would send a particular message to the market that you know here was an enterprise that could only survive on grants. So actually they might prefer a super low cost loan or, or a convertible grant that was set up as a you know, a convertible note to, to equity because that would send a very different signal to the market when they are trying to prove the track record of being able to pay back a loan um, to access more commercial capital. So likewise, um, giving our funding as a grant through an intermediary, which then would turn it into one of these other instruments. Um, and we were able to then um, convince our trustees that we should actually do more direct direct investing um, and have this wider toolbox uh, that we could use to meet the needs of the market um, and achieve the kind of impact we wanted to achieve. So in the next slide, um, and these are just my last few, to talk, um, to make it a little bit more concrete, um, here's our oldest investment, 2008. It goes almost back to the beginning of the foundation. Um, this was at a time when our foundation also had a sister equity investment fund, also called Good Energies, um, which was at one time the largest investor in clean tech and renewables globally. Um, and this was a company, a small social enterprise in out of Bangalore, India, um, not profitable, but achieving a lot of impact serving the most vulnerable communities in India. And our trustees or, and the investment managers on the on the commercial side um, couldn't make the the deal work commercially and we ended up making an investment into the company from the foundation so we made an equity investment figuring even if this company um, doesn't 
turn a huge profit. In the meantime, they're going to have a lot of impact. So we really were impact focused. I think our accountants actually wrote off the investment. Um, here we are many years later and um, and Selco has actually been profitable for 10 years um, plus. And they continue to serve the poorest of the market. Um, they are largely, are largely foundation owned um, and the foundation owners uh, choose not to receive a dividend to have all um, profits uh, reinvested into the company. And that has allowed Selco to grow very slowly and continue to meet the needs of the poorest customers um, while also taking great care of their own staff. For example, during COVID, they were able to get through that without laying off any of their more than 500 um, staff people, even though their revenues absolutely plummeted. Um, so that's been a great place for us to learn not only about the solar market, um, but how social enterprises can be set up in a profitable way and earn modest profits um, and sort of keep profits modest so that they can continue to serve um, the poorest people in the world. So the next example um, is Coco Networks. So this is a company based in Nairobi, India, or Nairobi, uh, Kenya, that um, has this ethanol fueled stove that's shown here. And then on the right, they have this kiosk system, like an ATM, but you purchase your fuel there. Um, and that's been the big um, innovation in what they do. So we made a series of convertible grants to Coco Networks um, and really supporting them in a time when they were struggling to raise commercial investment, even from impact investors. Um, they have now grown substantially since we first started supporting them in 2015-16, and they're coming on a million customers, a million households that they're serving um, in Kenya and, and should be able to expand to other countries. Um, soon. So it's been super exciting to watch them grow. Something interesting for us is we ended up deciding not to convert to be equity shareholders. Um, at the time that we needed to convert when they were doing their large series A um, round of investing, um, they were still small and our trustees were concerned about some of the potential reputational risks of being connected to, to any kind of company. They just, they were a little more risk averse at the time about that long-term connection. Um, but we found an interesting way to exit in a way that provided more impact. So we were able to donate what would have been our shares to a new foundation that allows the non-management staff and employees of Coco Networks to become shareholders in their company, um, providing an uh, incentive for um, employees there to contribute to the, the good of the country or the company. So that's just to show that there, you can be creative in your exit um, to, if you don't want a financial return, you might be able to get even more impact out of it. So then the final example, and, and that's when I'll stop, is um, a couple of grants and loans we made to Charm Impact, or rather one grant and one loan. Um, so we first made a grant and we often do that um, to sort of to get to know you, to get to know the management team, to get to know the work of an organization. Um, and then we might follow with the loan. So Charm is, uh, a combination crowdsourced and um, high net worth individu individual uh, debt fund. So they raise debt and investment and pass it on as small scale debt to very small startups in, in Africa, focused on locally managed companies and gender diverse management teams. And they're really filling a gap of these startup companies that might need 10, 15, 20, 30,000 dollars rather than the 100,000, half a million dollars, which some of the larger debt providers are able to provide. Um, and we provided them with a grant, which they then blended into. Um, the debts, and then we provided them a loan 
in part, as I mentioned before, so that they can prove that they can pay the loan back um, and raise other commercial money. And I think iGravity has um, blended their capital along with that. Um, so one key learning we learned there is just the entity setup of how Charm works and the platform that they use um, worked for me from an impact perspective. And at the last hour, um, our accounting and legal team had a trouble, had a sort of problem with that setup. And so having your ducks in a row internally so that everybody has as complete information early on in the deal is key to make sure that there's not some hang up right at the end. Um, so we've been working on our internal processes to make sure that our legal team, our you know accounting and finance team, um, understand the key aspects of any deal before we get to our impact investment committee uh, on their decision. So I'm going to leave it off on that, um, and I suspect more will come up in the question and answer. So back over to you, Fred or Morgan. Thank you, Stephanie, for these. Uh super examples and very uh, very uh, extraordinary uh, i find um i don't know is anybody uh, has a question please uh, you know turn off your mute sign and and, and raise the question now because i think we can spend a few minutes on 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 that and then maybe while while people think about a question uh, stefani I, I have one you know i i think you mentioned earlier on one of the first example you did was because you couldn't find a commercially viable way to invest and then so you you went into the the impact first arm of of good energy to, to do that did you have examples of some investment you would have made that move into the the traditional investment after a few years after a while is, is there a transition that you can observe and and how long would it take for such transition to to happen yeah, I mean, one of our guiding principles with our impact investing is that when commercial investors, and we might even include sort of others on that impact investment spectrum, are willing to come in, then that's the time for philanthropy to pull back. Not necessarily exit right away, if that exit could be uh, disruptive, <coughs> but our trustees are definitely worried about have, having our philanthropy seen as just underwriting somebody else's profits or excessive profits. Um, I mean, I think Co Coco is a good example. They're, they're doing really well in their fundraising and have been able to grow um, and expand because of their ability to raise equity investment. So, and that happened very soon after we decided not to convert. Um, but the that didn't really start happening probably until... 2020 or 2019, I think just before the pandemic, and actually the pandemic spurred a lot of people to um, to start buying these stoves because charcoal was harder to, to find. Um, and for many of the businesses, it, it definitely takes patience. And I think that's something that a lot of commercial capital doesn't have. Um, so sticking with companies um, for, you know, three to seven years um, is is definitely necessary. And that's a luxury that philanthropy has um, when we're only focused on impact. Even many of our grants are at least two to three years, but we that's the individual grant, but we support our grantees for um, typically six to nine years. Um, so I did see one question in the chat um, from Petra yeah. about... Yeah. Um, collaboration between investees and grantees. So yeah, one of our, yeah. Um, did you want to elaborate on that? Should I just go ahead and answer? Um, okay. Yeah, actually what we do um, in, in our trust is to we try to um, um, yeah, organize um, uh, cross-pollination between uh, what we call our partners, uh, that can be grantees or what we give loans to. Um, but we recently started that. So I was really uh, triggered by what you said about lessons learned and, and how do you um, yeah, organize that? Yeah. You elaborate on that, please. Yeah. So sometimes it, it happens informally that um, I hear about something a grantee or an investee is doing and, and 
recognize, ah, oh, you know, having a conversation with another grantee could be really useful. Sometimes it happens more in uh, more formally that our partners will get together and have formal MOUs. That's a little bit more common when there's a for-profit business and a, and a nonprofit. Um, but this has come out of seeing that our you know, our grantees have strengths and weaknesses. And so matching up, for example, um, a partner that is very strong in working with grassroots communities mm -hmm. with a partner that's maybe based in, in Delhi or in Nairobi and is more of a think tank, but is quite di divorced from, from sort of the community reality. Having them each bring their strengths to each other um, allows the reality on the sort of in communities to translate into, into policy. Um, likewise, investees, um, you know, the social enterprises we end up working with, many of them have some um, sort of open source or commitment to open source with their with their work, maybe not with, you know, their basic business model or how they're going to make a profit, but with some of the lessons learned or some portion of what they're doing. Um, and so encouraging them to speak to others in the field to figure out how their work can have a social benefit that goes beyond what they're doing just for their customers, but can, can benefit the entire sort of field of energy access. Um, and that it all comes from our our desire to have a comprehensive program or a coherent co uh, program where the work of our different grantees and investees is linked enough so that's having more impact than a whole bunch of independent projects. And, and I think we have a question from uh, Tasneem as well. Yes, Thank you, Stephanie. If there is time, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Super. So thank you very much for the presentations. I'm, I'm really happy that Tanesh uh, Kothari is also participating, invited me to this. Um, uh, I, I come from the civil society NGO sector space. I've worked in India for very long. And I understand a lot of investment is flowing into technologies where the money is coming back or there is a potential to get money back. But there are certain spaces where it's hard to get return of investment, no? So it's like, how do you how do you play around that? And there are still a lot of NGOs and grassroots NGOs that still re require this kind of uh, investment or funding investment. So I don't know if this is a question, but it's just a comment, perhaps mm -hmm. as well. It's like, how do you how do you do this? How do you work around this? Because everywhere I see there's investment for climate friendly technologies or technologies, but there are other basic goods that don't really fit in there. So how do you how do you work around that? Maybe it's not directly to you, Stephanie, because I know you're with good energies, but still it's just it's just out there to to comment yeah. on. Thanks. Yeah, I mean I think one of the points I mentioned early on is that you know we embrace market based approaches and and social investing within the two areas of good energies where it's often a really good fit. But in other areas where the family philanthropy operates, for example, in education, um, there's a need for a lot of money there, but maybe not an opportunity to make profitable returns. Um, so it's not appropriate everywhere. I think the other thing that's key, even in the energy access field, is that um, there's a growing recognition within the sector, and maybe soon it will happen outside the sector, um, is that electrification has never happened anywhere in the world without significant subsidy, right? It didn't happen in Europe or in the United States without government subsidy. So why do we expect it to be possible for enterprises and businesses to profitably meet the needs of the poorest customers in the world um, without any kind of subsidy, when they're also up against traditional, um, you know, grid-based electricity and fossil fuels that which receive a huge subsidy. So I think there's a there's a need to match expectations mm -hmm. of returns. Um, which is why I see a real need for philanthropy still in energy access and encouraging, you know, companies to continue to meet, you know, the needs of customers who maybe they shouldn't be trying to extract a big profit out of them. Um, and maybe it'll never be attractive or it's parts of the market will never be attractive to investors who are seeking huge uh, rates of return. But um, there are other investors who might be happy with much lower returns of eight or nine percent or philanthropies who just want to get back a portion of their capital because they're impact focused. Um, 
So I'll check the questions that are coming in in the chat and try to note those. And I think at the very end, after we hear from Audrey, um, we'll have a chance to answer more questions. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks so much. Thank you, Stephanie. And absolutely, we, we definitely will have some time to, to discuss more questions. And then I will, you know, use also Tasneem uh, question to, to introduce Audrey from Jacobs Foundation, because we will precisely touch a new sectors um, also around education. And so we'll have a, a few highlights there of what's possible in, in terms of moving to market returns or not. So with that, uh, I give you the word, Audrey, to, to introduce uh, the Jacobs Foundation. Sure, thank you, Frederick. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be there with you and, and reflect a bit more on impact investment broadly and, um, and describe you feature uh, what we have done in that area. Um, I will, I think, I mean, we're pretty close to what has done good energy. Uh, the only main, I mean, the only big difference is our uh, focus. We are only in education. Um, can we go to the net? And I'll share, yeah, I've seen Deborah, your request. I'll share my contact details in the, um, in the box um, after my presentation. So before, before telling you what we have done in impact investment, I'd like to say a couple of words on Jacob Foundation. Um, so I've been working with them uh, since 2017 when I was based in, um, in Ivory Coast. Um, I'm now working for them as a consultant. Um, and Jacob Foundation is a foundation, a Swiss foundation, a family one, which has been settled in 1989. Uh, by Klaus Jacobs, and uh, which who was himself an entrepreneur. Um, he like he built up Adeco, he built up um, Barry Calbo, and Barry Calbo is still an asset uh, that is part of the Jacob Foundation, where where our um, funding come from, and allow us to um, to do uh, some projects. Uh, from a um, grant making approach, we have this. I mean. Jacob Foundation is a philanthropy organization, so our main approach is really uh, doing grant, but we wanted to try to do things differently and make the project more sustainable, and that's why we've decided to, um, to try with impact investment. We did not move from uh, grant to impact investment, it was just adding something else and to see, try to compare and see how it works. You can go in on the following slides. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so as I said, the Jacob Foundation has been in the space since um, three, yeah, three, decade, three decades now. And it's really, I mean, our, our main activities are really rooted on in science, on issues of child development and learning. And so in 2015, the Jacob Foundation decided to really focus and act in one country. Um, so the country which was chosen at that time was Ivory Coast. Why Ivory Coast? Because this is like the biggest uh, producer of cacao. And we set up there an initiative called TREK, Transforming Education in the Cocoa Community. Um, so the whole idea was really like to improve the quality of education in that country. And, and again, it was, I mean, we were having a really like a class, a traditional approach by making grants, working with um, civil societies, with implementing partners, and also with, the, with policy. Um, and we, we had like a small portion of funding where we could like uh, test and do a pilot of impact investment. And it is what we have done. And this started in 2017. You can go in on the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so I think where where did this uh, impact finance, impact investment came from is really like this idea that we want to listen more to the market. Uh, we want to make sure that we do answer to a need um, to a need uh, on the market. And we were thinking that impact investment could do this. Um, and we wanted to develop a model that could be viable, commercially viable and sustainable over time. So this was our like our big wish. And, um, and it appears to be, well, 
very complicated, especially in the education space, especially in Ivory Coast, where well, Ivory Coast is a tough place and, um, and the ecosystem here is very, very nascent. So it's hard, I mean, it's hard for people to pay for, for education. So, so it question, I mean, it question the use of impact investment in that kind of geographic space, not necessarily um, beyond that space, but I mean, and that's why today we have more reflection on, we know what we want to finance. We know the role that as a foundation, we would like to play in that space, but we're still looking at how to finance. And this is really like an open question. Uh, that we're still exploring and that we're still like learning from this like five-year pilot in Ivory Coast. Um, you can go on the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, this is, um, you will see this slide and the two, yeah, I think the two other slides is really like a recap of what we have done in Ivory Coast. So at that time, we, we were having a very hands-on approach even if we were um, a small team. So the size of the portfolio might uh, seem to you very small, which is the case. And the, we were really like trying, trying what? Trying the financial instrument. Um, so for some of them, we were um, directly investing in companies. It was the case for Eneza, for Chuckboard Education. For others, like for example, we did partner with um, Investisseur et Partenaire, a French fund. And we have set up like a fund which, which was called Education Impact Fund. Um, we really needed that. I mean, to go back to your point, Stephanie, I think we really need that like collaboration and a space where to learn all together because they were like really like oriented um, on financial return. We were only focused on impact. And even if it was hard like to, um, to reconcile our views, I mean, we need to confront our ideas and our views to also understand I mean, what is our role here in that, in, in that space, in the education space, and what can we achieve with impact investment that cannot be done with a grant? You know, I think this is imp it's important to get that difference. It's, and it's hard to get the answers. It does take time. And I feel like with the investor and partner, um, the, the education impact fund, we, we invested in, in seven local companies. And yes, yeah, some of them, well, did great. Others, no, we, we know that we were taking a risk, but still, I think it was a very enriching experience, which lead to, um, to more initiative. For example, investor and partner, now they are, they, um, they get like funding from MasterCard Foundation and, and they are like managing this fund of fund. So not necessarily, not only in the education space, but there is, they were able to build their track record because we were there and ready to take that risk. Um, so this is the kind of impact that we have created in the Ivory ecosystem. And then apart from like, aside from direct investment and this uh, partnership, we also did like, more indirect investment, for example, with RIFA, uh, Blue Orchard. So, um, and this one, I think it was really about trying to, uh, to see if we could get, beside the impact that we were trying to achieve, if we could let, get also a financial return. And, and I think like the impact that we really um, created in that space, was like we were trying to train the loan officer and making them aware of the needs of the um, of the farmers and making sure that the loan condition was acceptable for them and it was able it was possible for them to to have access to affordable loan for their children to go to school. Um, and and yeah, you may know this, but like as a foundation, I mean, our purpose is not like to make money at all. We're really like driven by impact. And even if it appear that we make money from this investment, any dollar from this investment will be reinjected in in our project, either through grant. I mean, then it's a, a common pocket, but it's not for us to make money. It's really about this idea of having like. To, uh, going back to this sustainability, because if you if you see all the NGOs like that, I mean fundraising all the all the time they spend to fundraise, etc., and they don't even know if in two or three years they will be there. 
Well, if you know that you have like something viable from a commercial standpoint, then you might be able well to grow and to um, to create more impact, to preserve the impact that you've created. So this was really like our assumption. Uh, can you go on the next? Um, I'm always deviating from, from the slide. Sorry for this. Can you go on the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, this will be, sh I, I don't need to go into uh, so much detail. Um, you can find more on this company and on our investment. I mean, through the slide here that will be shared with you after uh, that uh, that uh, session, but also on our website. Um, can you move to the next? Yeah, also next slide. Um, so yeah, here, so, so, I haven't said this, but like the Jacob Foundation is really a learning organization and we're trying to learn um, from our, our um, from well, from our experience, from our failures also. It's really important to reflect on the failures and it's something hard to do. Um, and so we have tried to do this through um, with a video and you can click on this and I've written down two articles, one for AVPA and another one for the Jacob Foundation, where we're trying to extract the learning from this experience. For this session, I'll zoom on only two, two learning that you will find uh, on the slide after. Uh, the first one is exit. Um, so... I think, again, it's important to identify the right financial instrument that you would like to use for the type of companies that you would like to support. And we've tried like traditional financial instruments, mostly equity. Um, so we became a shareholder of this company, but now this is a question of an exit. And I think when we entered in that transaction, we were not necessarily sure where the company would be at the time of the of the plan exit. So we were thinking that five years after the transaction, we were able to exit. And the exit that we envisioned at that time was either the company is able to pay us back at, um, at a pre-agreed price, or they would find an external buyer that would be able to take, uh, to take us out and take our position. It appears to be very, very challenging. And we realized that there was like no secondary market at all and no one was ready to take our position. So this could be from a commercial standpoint, this could be easily explained in the sense that even after five years, this company are quite fragile. And even if they have grown tremendously well, it's not enough for a fund or private equity to come in uh, because of the, um, of the level of risk that type of investment requires. So it would mean that it, it remains the space of philanthropy. I think uh, this was mentioned by Stephanie saying that a philanthropy organization need to remain in that space until a commercial investor can come in. And I think at the time of the investment, we were aware that we needed to be patient uh, but we were thinking that five years was enough. And in fact, in, in fact, it was not. So if we had to redo this, we would need like to be along this company, beside this company for at least seven, even 10 years min minimum uh, for them to be able to, um, to, to build traction and to be an, an interesting case for VC fund and private equity. So when we decided to exit, unfortunately, we were not at that point. And unfortunately, also, we were not like the right, we were not anymore the right investor. Um, we were not able to bring what the company needed at that time. So we had to think through and we had to think about like creative exit pathway. And the only way we have done this so far is to, um, is, to, um, is to build agency of the employees. Employees were there for like at, from the beginning and we really wanted them uh, to be rewarded for this and to build their agency and to be responsible for the growth of the company. And this was one of the mechanisms that we, we are, we're, we're currently uh, uh, executing right now. It's really like giving, it's really about giving our shares to employees. 
um, you could ask, I mean, for a symbolic amount, making sure that they put skin in the game. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I mean, our intention is not, I mean, our intention behind this was really like how, if we're not making money from this, which, which is fine because we knew that there was a risk, how we can at least ensure that we do preserve the impact that the company have created and they can grow also the impact. Um, so this was one of the ways that we have exited our position. Now, uh, but we would do, I mean, we would do things differently today. And that's why I think um, I would like to know more on how Good Energy has done the convertible grant, because I think like this could solve out the exit challenge. I mean, like by providing a convertible grant to a social company, you can like build that trust relationship between a company and yourself. They can use your money as a grant and as a foundation, you can decide to convert the grant into equity when you think that the company is mature enough for you to come in and think about an exit scenario, which is plausible, plausible sorry for you. And I think a convertible grant is really a good um, a good financial instrument to think through if you want to avoid the exit challenge. Um, yeah, so this is one of the key learning, the exit. And then the second one is how to achieve and improve impact. So this one is our like biggest challenge ever, especially in education. Today, what we would like to know is I mean how efficient the solu the education solution provided by the social companies are into the hands of the teacher into the hands of the school. This is an answer that we that is super hard to to track. It's super hard to understand. Mm -hmm. And and when we build that uh, portfolio of uh, six or um, five six investments. We were relying on the social companies that we, working, that we were working with. We were expecting them to report us on the impact that they were creating. And, and it appears, I mean, this is a too big ask for the social companies. They are new to the market. And of course, they do care about their customers, the children, the teacher, the schools. But they are not in a they are not in a position to um, to give the data that as a foundation you would like to have to say hey see what we have done see how impactful we have been and you have been and this this was too too difficult for them and and having like this um, this declaratory mechanism and we were not even able to re verify the integrity of the data. And I mean, this was really like a limit that we were aware of along this um, journey with the social companies. And that's why we were thinking of a new model, of a new financing model, ensuring that like impact and impact measurement is embedded into the financial instrument. Um, and that's why we've decided to move away a bit from like the financial instrument that we used in the past, which was not necessarily like fitted to the um, to the market and to what we also want to track uh, to our strategy. And so that's why with iGravity, Roots of Impact and SDC, we've built an outcome based fund, which is called Impact Link Fund for Education. So this is the next, um, sorry, this is the next uh, slide. Um, yeah, you can, yeah, this is, yeah, exactly. So we committed, well, as you see, committed for a million, we've committed a three million to deploy capital uh, to support uh, companies in the global, in the global South, so in Africa and the MENA region. And, and we are working here with two financial instruments. The first one is a social impact incentive. So we expect no, uh, capital return at all, but at least we know what we will be paying for. So the companies need to prove that they have achieved the pre-agreed outcome. For us, it's more about learning outcome. Um, and I, I really like this idea because even if it's hard, I mean, the design phase is super complex and it does take time, 
but we rather prefer to sit down now and to know what we want to uh, see in two or five years, seven years, instead <laughs> of, of like not necessarily knowing what we're financing and the impact that we're looking for later on. So I think like really sitting down right now is a, is a critical time and is the appropriate time to do so. And we'll also use another instrument where the incentive is uh, is less, which is an impact link loan. For this, uh, we will expect the fine, the capital to return to us, and there will be a decrease of the interest rate. Um, and then beside this, so this uh, impact link fund for education, we've set up um, a major initiative that we call LAFE, Learning EdTech Impact Fund. And here we work with um, EdTech VC Fund. So not in the same geographies at all. These ones are located in the United States, most of them, and in, in Europe. Um, and we commit 30 million to be deployed here. And the whole idea is to try to influence this um, this industry, this tech education technology industry, and make sure that we are that what we financed and the companies that we support, they have evidence on the product that is now on the market or will be on the market. I mean, today it's our responsibility to all as a foundation, as parents, as even social companies, making sure that the product that we build they do make a difference for the kids. And this is, a, I mean, unfortunately, this is something that we do not know because it's, it's hard to assess. Um, but in, the, in this life, we're really trying, I mean, investment for us is really a means um, to be around the table and to have discussion about evidence and scientific research and how to make sure that we build um, evidence around this product and that like kids, they do not have like this product just for fun or just for a time and that it does make a difference. And especially in the areas where, well, these kids need um, these ed tech um, products because either, I mean, because there are some weaknesses in their environment. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll put there, this is the end of my uh, presentation. So happy, I mean, happy to take um, any question that you may have. Thank you very much, Audrey. Um, let's see if we have a direct question. I think uh, I have Mark uh, who wants to ask a question. Please go. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Audrey, for this very interesting presentation. Um, I have two questions. The first one is around um, the exit strategies, which you mentioned on the previous slide. Have you have you also looked at um, potential buyers that are not VC or private equity, but that could simply be educational groups like North Anglia or there are various um, New York listed groups which are solely concentrated on uh, the educational sector? Uh, so is that an... Yeah, I think, Mark, I think um, the quick answer would be no in the sense that, uh, as a, I mean, and again, this go back to a broader question for us as a foundation, what role we want to play in this and the um, and the exit. I mean, we agreed on an exit strategy with these social companies at the very beginning, which appears, I mean, unrealistic at the end. And um, and the one which were I would say like we were we were trying also you know to transfer this responsibility also to the companies and to the entrepreneur to the team and they were the one trying I mean to fundraise they were the one like making the connection and trying to reach the right people to talk to because at the end I mean you know when you ask people to come in you are out. So this is really like a matter for the entrepreneur to make sure that they have the people they want around the table. So that's why we've decided to work that way with the with the companies. But it's a it's a fair point that you make. I mean, we we've left we've left um, we've left uh, this organization to drive the process. We have tried we have tried um, on our end, maybe not enough because also we have we're a very very small team, and and it does take time to um, to exit. And this the exit strategy that I mentioned was like the simplest way. To move forward and the one that the companies like really appreciate also um mm -hmm. but no i we but that's a good that's a fair point that you make 
I'm just mentioning it because I live in a Swiss village where there are five private schools and they're all run by um, investor groups, which are generally worldwide. And uh, I see a, a massive trend of, um, of education groups buying up other schools and that, that's on the lateral side, but why not go down the ladder and buy uh, or help or in incorporate um, some of these investments also into the curriculum because most of these private schools have a, have a service element which the kids need yeah. to do in a way or another. And so, and the second one is just is just a, a remark concerning the other the the the, the financial instruments. Um, I'm not sure if it's any help here, but about 15 years ago, I launched a social impact note, which was basically getting uh, the investors or the capital market in the broader sense to to. Uh, to, to help um, the philanthropic side of, of sectors. Um, I, I, had, I did plans for a note to, linked around education with all the metrics and, and, and uh, so I'm not sure if that's of interest to you, but if it is, maybe you can drop me a line and I can send you, it was never yeah, launched. Yeah. The interest rates went in the wrong way, but uh, interest rates are coming back around now. So it could be interesting uh, to look at that again, if that's of any interest to you guys. Yeah, it is. And it's particularly relevant for us now that we're like designing and structuring the deal to impact Lincoln for education. So, yeah, we should continue that conversation um, separately. I'd love that. Thanks thank, for you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I think we, we have another question from Joseph. Hi, thank you so much. And great presentation. Um, just another question, but not in terms of the financing, but in terms of the actual nature of the education that you're looking to um, scale up, there's a difference between very young age, broad education on everything versus maybe targeted education at a later age on retraining on particularly uh, on, on particular sectors and needs, most notably agriculture. Have you looked at models where you can scale up that retraining and actually empower or, or, or help um, scale up models on, on, on particular functional areas? Uh, in agriculture in particular is my fo focus in this question. So no, because now we're, I mean, we're very, so Joseph, now we're very much, so we have a, a really a specific mandate um, when we're doing uh, impact investment right now. Um, it was not necessarily uh, the case in 2017, where the whole purpose was really like to um, to plug in impact investment into this track initiative. Um, but now it's separate. Everything that we're doing, it's really like separate from uh, from track, which actually does not exist. There is now a second chapter for track, which is called uh, Clear, and it's a multi stakeholder partnership with the um, Ivorian government, with the cocoa industry, and with Tam Foundation. Um, and so to come back to impact investment, now our, our mandate is really like K-12. So K-12, it's uh, from three years old to 17 years old, 18 years old. And, and we're really much into um, not necessarily on everything linked to retraining, et cetera. We're looking, we're really looking into uh, like how to improve numeracy, I mean, foundational skills, numeracy and literacy skills. And it appears maybe to you that we're very, um, very narrow in that sense, which, which is the case, but at the same time, we need to stay focused on something instead of just like going from, from one area to another. And I feel also, you know, that's why it's so difficult to collaborate. I mean, we can collaborate in a different manners, but uh, we need this collaboration between a foundation, between NGOs, etc. But I feel this is my personal experience that it's hard uh, to collaborate because we each have, uh, each have our own vision, our own views and our own strategy. And, and sometimes it's hard to like reconcile these views, even if we wish to collaborate with others. Um, so yeah, does this answer your question, Joseph? Yes, yeah, somewhat. I, it, it's no, but I effectively I wasn't advocating for, uh, if anything, for being even more narrow. Um, so especially when in many of the regions that you are active in, agriculture is something that even at a young age, many of the professional. Uh, skills that you're teaching will end up at sort of uh, 
looking at regenerative agriculture is a mindset shift as well in many of those areas. And I think collaboration among within sort of the how as an education is one thing versus the why collaboration with groups that would require uh, better training on regenerative um, methods, for example, um, whether it's cocoa or anything else, I think is, is even narrow, but opens up different types of partnerships and collaborations. Mm -hmm. But again, happy to discuss that offline. But thank you so much for uh, the insights. Yeah, I think Joseph, you should have a look. Um, there is this. Um, we're trying. So we we are scaling up Trek, and Trek was not just about impact investments. And so we tested different uh, methodology, and for one of which was. Um, proven to be uh, to work is teaching at the right level so we will deploy teaching at the right level in the in the i mean in the um, in the rural area in the ivory coast that's great thank you thank you thank you thank you joseph and audrey uh, there's a couple more questions which i will address and but there's more uh, a more general one that comes back to the tools and i wanted to reach out to both stephanie and, and audrey you mentioned this convertible grant. You mentioned that you end up also owning equity in, in some of these companies in Africa. How easy it is, or what are the issues for a foundation to own equity? Because I think I hear from many other foundations that is absolutely not something they prepare to do. So, uh, you know, maybe you could say, share just a few words on that, what it takes to do it. Do you want to start, Sylvania, or shall I go for it? Well, I can give a shorter answer. We only have one equity holding now. Um, and and I get I mean in Selco without giving <laughs> too much information, it's all very easy until something goes wrong. And then you realize as a shareholder, you know, with your name, you know, on their website and and linked legally that the stakes are higher, you know, on reputational risk, on legal risk and things like that. And so making sure that you really, you know, have a strong board and and advocates there um, is super important. Um, and it's 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 actually made me a little bit more averse to being an equity <clears throat> owner because we don't have a lot of capacity internal internally for that. Um, other foundations that we work with, they have a whole dedicated team and consultants that they hire to you know, sit on the boards and, and things like that. Um, and we don't have that ability right now. So it definitely takes resources and understanding of, of what that kind of ongoing connection. It's a lot easier to get out of a loan and just write it off, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Mm -hmm. But Audrey, you have much more experience. No, I think I totally agree with you, uh, with you, Stephanie. So the way that we've managed it, um, so we became shareholder of these companies, and to bring the right expertise, uh, we we set up board, um, and we asked to expert to to be a member of that board, um, and I think that's why I mean because we had a, we were a very small team and we did not necessarily have the right knowledge at that time. So the idea is really like to bring in experts that can really like support the growth of the company. This is our responsibility as a shareholder. Now, I mean, I think before going into an equity holding, I think the most important question that two important questions that a foundation need to to ask themselves is one, to what point, I mean, I mean, what is, I mean, what is the purpose? What is our goal? To what point, where do we want to plug out, you know? Because this company, they do, re they do rely on you, but you don't even know what you're able to offer them. And so mm -hmm. they are able, they are, they are, they accept you around the table because you have like, well, quite, you have money to offer, but you need to think what else I can offer. And why equity? Can I achieve what I want to achieve through another mechanism? Because again, with equity, you have this exit challenge. And to be honest, this exit challenge takes even more time than structuring the deal and all the due diligence, et cetera. And it, it does not bring any good at the end. So if I had like to go back, I would maybe like use a different type of instrument or maybe do concessionary equity. 
um, based on an impact traje trajectory that we would agree with uh, with the company. But again, even building an impact trajectory is super difficult for this uh, company that are at the very beginning of their journey, and they don't even know where they will be. I mean, they have, a, of course, ambitious plan. Um, this is the spirit of a good entrepreneur, but they don't even know if it's realistic. So yeah, yeah. it's it's um, it's a uh, I mean. And, and I'm not sure at the end, you know, I'm not sure that the found, I mean, this is becoming, impact investment is becoming a more and more transparent field where a foundation, they do exchange what you have done, what has worked, what has not worked. But I'm not necessarily sure, even if you're using, for example, a convertible grant that you would convert into equity. And I think I, when I was hearing you, Stephanie, I mean, like, well, we did not convert at the end. and um, and 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 I and I think foundations they don't necessarily have the answer at the time that they're doing the transaction. Yeah. Um, and That's super interesting, also, Audrey. And also, I think, I think, think also a follow-up question. You know, I, I think uh, I, I, as um, Stephanie was mentioning earlier on in one of the examples with Charm, I gravity has been involved in in that situation where we kind of um, help structure a note around all the investment that Charm were doing directly in these small SME in Africa. And the note is something that we want to, to sell directly to our investors. In fact, we invested in the note thanks to the first loss that Good Energy has provided. So you really have a blended finance uh, instrument there that, uh, that can help investor to, to dare investing in Africa, because I think that's the way to put it. There, it's still very remote to have a SME in Nigeria or in Kenya or Uganda and, and to, to basically being able to value the risk. You know, I think there's a big misperception of the risk. And so my question to both of you is that, I mean, obviously we love that structure, it's unfortunately, I can say it openly here, it's easier to find uh, first loss capital like good energy, you know, the IKEA and so on, than still investors, although you have 20% of the, of the note, which is at first loss. So question to you is these blended in finance instrument, do you see them coming up as the solution of the future? You know, a way to basically not make you completely involved into the institution, having a third partner that is actually taking that risk and you provide a, a de-risking. Is that the way forward or, or, or is it one of the way forward? How, how do you see that at the moment? Uh, I think there is no right, I mean, there is no one way forward, I think, of course, blended finance is one of the scenarios that needs to be explored. And I, I like this idea that like uh, for as a foundation, you're taking the risk and you're de-risking the investment of others. Because again, if you can like attract additional, I mean, additional funding and also ensure that from the, from the get-go, you have people around the table that can contribute for, I mean, that can contribute for a longer term and they can also uh, bring more than just financial endowment, um, then I think it's super beneficial uh, for the social organization, for the social companies. And also, yeah, back to your point, Frédéric, I think indeed like blended finance offer offer uh, the possibility, the chance for a foundation to be less hands-on and also to learn from that, I mean, to learn from that space. But yeah, over to you, Stephanie, if you have any views on this. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen similar problems, maybe not directly on, um, you know, they're not being an off taker after us, the way Audrey described. Um, but if from the start, you have sort of your follow on funding or your more commercial funder um, in the conversation or already lined up, um, it actually allows the enterprise and, and also us to make sure that the support we're giving um, is moving the enterprise onto the path to where that follow on funder will come in, right? Because there's certain triggers or you agree on things. So we've done that with both philanthropies that we know are going to or are interested in providing follow up funding. Um, but also, for example, in a technical assistance facility that is connected to an investment fund um, to make sure that you know, the fund managers are giving input on what the, the TA should be achieving 
Um, likewise, the you know follow on philanthropies are saying from the beginning what they need to see for their money to come in. So mm -hmm. I think doing that in a blended way, it also allows me to go to my trustees to show, you know, our money really unlocked this. It's much more direct than, oh, and seven or eight years later, other investors happen to come in and maybe or maybe not our money had anything to do with it. Thank you, thank you both. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the emails. There was a question from uh, Kizek Edi um, on, on refugee investments. If, if you have been seen or involved in how to mobilize small enterprise around refugees. Yeah, I provided um, a brief answer in the chat. So we do have a number of partners that are working in um, both informal and formal um, sort of refugee camps or displaced persons camps, um, working to create enterprises there. I don't think it's a super profitable model in terms of outside investors, though the it can be profitable for those individual um, micro enterprises. These are more like productive use appliance um, machinery that's run on solar right in camps to build out that local economy. Um, the other area that might be related is providing solar energy through microgrids and, and other means to refugee settlements, which um, you know in, in conflict areas, uh, to help displace often black market fossil fuels that are contributing to the conflict in the area and provide something not only for the refugees, but for the host community, which again can lead to, to peace settlements. Our partner, Energy Peace Partners, is, is working on that kind of model. And they have some, they have an impact based fund that they've set up um, in part to um, provide the sort of capex for that kind of solar development. Mm -hmm and then a modest return to social investors um, investing in that fund. So there are some interesting models. And, and <clears throat> maybe I can add, um, Keith Keddy, uh, I'm not the expert in that field, but uh, with iGravity, we, we just launched uh, an initiative with the Danish Refugee Council, which is basically uh, opening up a fund which directly aims at supporting small enterprise in in Jordan and Uganda and, and potentially also Kenya in these uh, areas where, where there are refugees. So it's definitely a, a big topic for the Danish Refugee Council. And we're very happy to partner with them to do that. It's it's being launched uh, now, basically. I think the, the issue is to find the right vehicle and to attract a like-minded foundation who, who wants to, to, to boost that uh, initiative. So more, more to be shared on that if you're really interested. Um, I'm looking at uh, any other question, if somebody wanted to raise a, a last question. Right, it looks like Joseph has his hand up. Joseph, the, the word is yours, if you want. You're still on mute. I'm still on mute, I see, somehow. Apologies. Uh, it was just a question back to Audrey on, on your previous comments regarding the complications of shareholdership. And it, it's, it's, it, it is very labor time complexity intensive for most foundations. And what we found resonated well with some clients is to have the partnerships that um, go beyond uh, the silos. So, so when it when it when it comes to reaching out to the invest to the funds that the capital base for a foundation is invested in, and partnering up with them and leveraging their capabilities, especially as most of them, especially in the VC world, are looking to have a, a renewed approach to their whether it's Article Nine or uh, their ESG credentials, and the technical assistance can cross the internal bridge, as opposed to just in terms of external partnerships um, uh, in in, in uh, within the ecosystem uh, of, of, of the particular grantees. And, and one thing that helped on that scalability that we found resonated was working with the capital, with, with the investee funds on the capital base and saying, okay, well, how do we not leverage their competencies for that one shareholdership in that one company, but actually having a 
uh, pocket co-investments or, or um, some innovation on the actual investment base. So, so, so the, the the maturity of the investment from philanthropic capital all the way to the maturity of the company also is followed with the evolution of where the capital sits within uh, the grantee and, and capital involved in that direction as well. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that in, in, in internally or with some others as well and how that evolves, but that, that's also an interesting area to um, potentially explore and great to see what your or anyone else's echoes is on um, uh, crossing the internal bridge. Thanks, Joseph. No, super interesting. We can take this conversation um, separately if you wish. Um, I think the way that we have done it, we, we well, not formally, but we've set up a technical assistance facility uh, and we had like, we really, we really like audited their needs and trying to understand how we could like help the social companies to bring them from uh, point A to, uh, well, to move forward to a more major stage. Um, and I think, and I think also we, we need, beside the capital flowing in at the beginning, plus the, um, the technical assistance facility, make sure that you do have, of course, like outstanding, I mean, more capital to make sure that everything that is being advised, especially uh, for us on everything linked to evidence that they have still the funding to improve their solution. Um, and this is because instead of, and that's why Joseph, I think I was referring to, we need to make sure to what extent we can support this, uh, this, uh, social company. Of course, it goes beyond like the equity holding. You need to have all the surrounding uh, environment favorable for them to grow. So you need to have additional pockets, but, but the question is, it's, where do you stop and to what extent do you subsidize this company? Because the whole idea is to make them viable on their own, right? And so it's really, I mean, I have no answer, but like when do you stop and, and when it's becoming more like a grant approach than an impact investment approach? This was like also a difficult, uh, um, yeah, difficult to assess because of course we could like, and, and that's why I'm, I'm bringing, well, maybe grants is, is not, is not as bad as, as this, you know, so just, uh, very good. Yeah, no, certainly the grant is not as bad as that, but it, it's also a question of being able to have the follow-on capital ready, but from a different pocket, yeah. which is which is designed in its purpose for profit, uh, that, that can then be already part of the same conversation that's reinvesting for future grants, which is the nature of most foundations. Uh, and so, therefore, when looking at the strategic asset allocation within the capital base, having some of the underlying funds ready with the right agreements for that follow-on capital, so the competence on both sides evolves and scales up not sort of yeah. okay well we're taking as far as we can and let's see who else can help good luck um but no, I agree. again i'd be delighted to have that conversation um <laughs> and happy to connect uh, with anyone offline on that thank you thank, thank, thank you, you joseph for your insights yep i'm looking at the time i think <clears throat> we are just uh, past the time so um I, I want to to thank you uh audrey and stephanie it's been a real pleasure to to have your insights and your thoughts about uh, the work you do. And I think there's there's certainly more questions um, from many people. So if you do want to reach out, please don't hesitate. You can reach out to directly to Audrey, to Stephanie, or to iGravity. It would be a, a pleasure to do so. Um, uh, yeah, thanks again. Sorry again for being on the black screen. Um, but I think that was beyond my control. Um, and I, I want to thank you and give you the word, Deborah, for the final conclusion. Thank you. Unmute, Deborah. Deborah, you're muted. Unmute. <clears throat> Deborah, sorry. Here we go. We are on Zoom since two years, but the unmute <coughs> always forget it. But uh, yeah, thank you very <clears throat> much, Frederick, for this great moderation. So uh, it wasn't an issue at all to have you on black screen. You did a fantastic job. Um, Audrey, Stephanie, and Morgan, many thanks for your presentations. It was extremely insightful and a delight to be part of this session. Um, we have not uh, a fourth series planned yet, but if any of you have ideas or inputs, please reach out to Frederick. Happy to look into it and so we can facilitate um, part four. Um, and again, as I said earlier, I'll be sharing this recording and uh, the contact details of our speakers so you can reach out directly to them. And I'll check also with our speakers whether we can share some of the presentations with you. 
Um, yes, and make sure um, to connect our speakers. If there's anyone in our network that should meet them and know about their work, please um, do the connections. It was such a pleasure again. Thank you all for joining. And I wish you all a wonderful day ahead. And I look forward to seeing you at another impactful breakfast session. Take care, everyone. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye.